Healthy Show. I'm your host, Heike Turciano, and today we'll be discussing two subjects that are probably near and dear to most women's heart, and some guys as well, and that's going to be a discussion on cellulite and varicose veins. Now, there's a lot of misconceptions about what cellulite is, and a lot of people just think it's fat deposits. Okay, I'm, I'm overweight. And yes, that's a contributing factor, but when you get that mattressy kind of look, that little dots in it around it, it literally means that you've got fat cells beneath the skin becoming engorged with liquids. The key is to determine why the fat cells are so are becoming engorged with liquids. And most of that has to do with a collagen protein production problem uh, that binds all these cells together so then the fluids can fill in um, the spaces between the connective tissues. What causes it? Lots of debate on what the causes are. But Primarily, what we're looking at is very poor circulation, oftentimes getting to that particular region, be it the hips, the tummy, the arms. Those tend to be the most common areas of where cellulite tends to develop. And it does seem to come along with age as it appears as though people become less and less active. Uh, overweight is a contributing factor because obviously the more fat you have, the more potential for the spaces between the fat cells. So. Uh, dropping off the weight is uh, somewhat helpful as well to being able to uh, defeat or conquer the cellulite problem. Nutritional deficiencies, and we're going to discuss some of the things that help down the line, but poor diet, uh, poor uh, supplementation, or the lack of certain types of vitamins and nutrients, the good old potato chip diet or the good old hot dog diet, those are not nutrient dense foods. And as a result, when you have nutrient poor foods, Everything kind of goes, including the connective tissue in the skin and around your cellulite. So what helps? And that's what we're after here anyway. Ester C, uh, or esterified vitamin C, which is a fat-soluble vitamin C, um, with bioflavonoids. That combination together really helps the collagen protein matrix to reassemble itself so you don't have those little puckers in between. And I've got a dosage here of 1,000, 2,000 milligrams twice a day because most of the research supports you need higher dosages. And the ester C's, unlike ascorbic acid, if you took that higher dosage in ascorbic acid, it would give you a diarrhea. And that's obviously something we want to avoid while we're getting rid of our collagen. Um, an herb called Gouda Cola, real good research for collagen matrix in combination with vitamin C with bioflavonoids, has been shown in about a 500 milligram twice a day dosage. If you're consistent, will help reduce the collagen. Uh, things that can help increase circulation to the area and, and increase uh, metabolism. Uh, horse chestnut capsules and cream, actually topical applications of the area, really help uh, to get rid of that mattress look type of uh, phenomenon that you get with that cellulite. Kelp increases uh, the metabolism and uh, there's certain iodine sources which also help with thyroid uh, as well. Obviously, you don't want to do excessive amounts uh, of kelp, particularly if you're on, you're on a thyroid medication, but you require, you require a minimum of 150 micrograms of iodine. So kelp is a good source of iodines. It's a natural form that easily absorbs in the body that can help with metabolism. Exercise. Just about every lecture I give says exercise, 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 and it seems to be with blood pressure, cholesterol, whatever it be, exercise is paramount. It's very, very important as part of getting circulation into the area. 30 minutes of a day, very little to ask, and, and there's some good uh, statistical data that says for every hour you put in of exercise, you get two more hours of life out of it. So out of your out of your out of your body. So and you have more energy and you feel better. But as far as cellulite is concerned, getting the circulation in there, burning off some of the fat, getting the blood supply in that area helps with cellulite and a reduction of cellulite. Uh, lipo massage. Um, I know uh, we have a uh, massage therapist, Bobby Kenner, that works for us at one of our stores, and she uses lipo massage. Um, it's a technique that's taught to. Uh, and there's even actually a certification for lipo massage, and where they literally massage the area, get the circulation to that area, and uh, she's seen as well as other massage therapists I've spoken to, um, reduction in cellulite. That's just another way to get circulation into the area and get things flowing and moving. Um, 
very brief. It takes very, very little to work on Sile. But if you're consistent, based upon what I've got down on here, and then obviously whatever other research you do, uh, if you're consistent with it, it will definitely, definitely help you reduce, if not get rid of your cellulite. We're going to move on now to the varicose veins issue. Ah, okay. What is or what are varicose veins? Abnormally enlarged, bulging, bluish, lumpy looking types of veins. You're going to see them on mostly on the ladies' legs or guys' legs too. And they kind of stick out. They got kind of nagging, throbbing pain to them. They literally hurt. And what this is caused by, what causes it, is um, unlike the um, arteries, the veins have little valves in them that keep the blood from backing up into the, uh, into the veins. So these veins start to malfunction and they don't seem to be able, and they break down, they don't seem to be able to properly uh, not let the blood out. And so you'll get the swelling of the veins and, and they get inflamed and hardened. Um, overweight, lack of exercise, and genetics are probably one of the biggest contributing factors uh, to varicose veins. Just not moving or standing in one particular place for a long time. Uh, you know, having a lot of pressure where you're not getting any movement and circulation going. Um, pregnancy or a, a real drastic weight gain uh, can also contribute because you have a lot more weight and a lot more pressure going on the lower extremities of the body. Um, hormone replacement therapy and birth control pills can contribute uh, as well to varicose veins. Constipation, heart failure, liver disease, all various elements that you can kind of go back and say, mm, circulation is involved with this. So if your blood pressure is high, you're not getting good circulation. Kidneys, all of that involve a good circulatory system. And obviously, if the veins are the vein valves are not working properly, it's going to reflect itself in these items as well, too. Uh, a deficiency in vitamin C and bioflavonoids. I call it a form of scurvy, to be honest with you. I, I think this 60 milligram to keep you from getting scurvy, um, excellent to keep you from getting scurvy, but to be healthy, the body requires a lot more vitamin C with bioflavonoids. 75 years ago, from what I'm reading, a tomato, good juicy tomato, had 500 milligrams of a calcium ascorbate vitamin C. Now you're lucky if you got 25. It's because the nature of our farming is such that we use a lot of chemical fertilizers. We don't have these minerals going back into the soil that can, in which the fruit and the vegetables manufacture high levels of vitamin C. So we end up very vitamin C deficient. So when they say you can get it from your food, oh, maybe if we moved back 75 years ago, yeah. Now, no way. It ain't going to happen. Uh, it's just not there. Uh, organics can be helpful, but once again, Hmm. It depends on the type of organic farming you're dealing with as to whether or not they're putting these minerals back into the soil so that the fruit and vegetables can manufacture or be manufactured or come through into the fruit and vegetables. Um, what helps? Kind of interesting, we see that little ester C with bioflavonoids again for varicose veins. We were talking about it uh, on our, uh, uh, when you're talking about cellulite, once again, the veins need to maintain vascular flexibility. And when the collagen matrix gets hardened, and this goes blood pressure and other kidney circulatory issues, when they get hardened, nothing flows through. They don't move, they just swell. So the vitamin C with bioflavonoids increases the collagen matrix, okay? And it also reduces the blood clotting and increases circulation. So these two, kind of very, very vital if you have the cellulite we discussed before, or if you have bottom line varicose veins or any kind of circulatory issues. Um, CoQ10 uh, and dimethylglycine, I abbreviated DMG, helps with oxygen utilization. Um, when you can oxygenate and get oxygen flowing through the body, and you get that through exercising, you get that through eating um, vegetables or superfoods that are very high in greens, they carry oxygen well. Uh, CoQ10 and dimethylglycine, or DMG, helps you utilize the oxygen. That's hence why CoQ10 is so doggone good for the heart. But it also helps with, with the uh, blood vessels and the veins as well. 
Uh, Omega-369 fatty acids, be it fish oil, flax oil, walnuts, almonds, pecans, whatever you can get to get those good fats in the diet helps reduce inflammation, keeps things flowing in the vascular system, tells the liver, oh, you know, we don't have to produce as much cholesterol here. We're working fine and smooth. Reduces inflammatory issues. Um, pycnogenol or grapeseed extract. We have a local uh, physician, Dr. Lindbergh, who recommends it whenever his patients are on Coumadin, which is a type of a blood thinner, and it'll lead to all kinds of bruising all over the body. And doing 100 to 200 milligrams of grapeseed extract or pycnogenol helps strengthen the capillaries and the veins and blood vessels. So that's something that you can get to help strengthen them as well. A good multiple high in Bs. Since our food is so nutrient dense nowadays, not. A good multiple high in Bs and good, you know, various trace minerals like zinc, um, selenium, those types of uh, minerals that are necessary for good, wholesome uh, bone formation, circulation, survival, um, is necessary, I think, in most ailments that we've reviewed. Bromelain. Bromelain reduces inflammation. It comes from pineapple. It also uh, prevents some of that clotting, that coagulation of blood in one particular spot because it needs a little fibrin uh, in between those little uh, clotting cells. So it can help reduce inflammation and increase the ability or the body's ability to keep the blood flowing, reduce the clotting. Um, cayenne reduces pain and inflammation. You're thinking, cayenne, a hot pepper? Yeah, cayenne does come in capsules and it comes in various temperatures, but it increases circulation. And that's why you see a lot of blood pressure formulas that'll actually have cayenne in them. It increases the circulation and by that as well can reduce your pain and inflammation. So butcher's broom, ginkgo, uh, gouda cola, again, the gouda cola we talked about for cellulite and hawthorn. Once again, very good for lower extremity circulation. A lot of formulas that are uh, leg vein types of formulas include these um, um, uh, herbs in them. Mindful that with ginkgo biloba, if you're on any blood thinners, uh, you have to avoid that uh, if you are. Uh, horse chestnut cream. I think we talked about that back on cellulite again. All this is a circulatory issue. Topically applied can reduce pain, reduce inflammation. Simple little inexpensive little horse chestnut cream with no side effects, no nothing. When we're talking about varicose veins, once again, like everything else we seem to have, it's very much influenced with diet. And whenever you can go organic, because the organic does tend to use, the organic fertilizers do tend to be more mineral dense and nutrient dense if properly done. Lots of fruits and vegetables and avoid refined carbohydrates and saturated heavy meat fats, trans fats, because they cause a lot of vascular inflammation. So we're eating those good walnuts, almonds, pecans, flax oil, even primrose oil, borage oil, fish oils. Reducing inflammation down is paramount. And we're finding that a lot of diseases and disorders are inflammatory related. So if we can reduce the inflammation down, and that includes varicose veins, oh boy, the body just kind of moves along a lot more smoother. Um, 30 to 35 grams of fiber. I'll see, how many people are doing five to six servings of vegetables and fruit every day? Ah, uh, sometimes. I gotta tell you, it's very, very important for adequate amounts of fiber. If you don't do adequate amounts of fruits and vegetables, you don't get fiber and certain phytonutrients that help with oxygenation. So if you're not a good vegetable eater, ugh, not good. You're gonna wanna, there are supplements that you can get that are vegetable powders, and then you're gonna be adding in some fibers like psyllium fiber, apple pectin fiber, um, flax fiber, there's so many different types of fibers that are water-soluble fiber. Wheat bran fiber, bulking fiber, doesn't move things along. The key is you want to keep circulation going. You want to detox when the body uses the veins and arteries to get rid of the, the stuff and, and, and it gets dumped into your bowel. You want to be sure it gets out of the body before it's re, reabsorbed back in again. Um, eating garlic, ah, ginger, misspelling there. Ginger, onions, pineapple. Those are, tend to be hotter types of um, foods. You know, when you eat them, you kind of a little bit of perspiration. Um, and same will go with cayenne. They really can increase uh, circulation and reduce inflammation as well. Something I came across that I wasn't aware of is blackberries and cherries um, really do help ease 
uh, and prevention actually of, of varicose veins because they tend to be alkali and they're really rich in certain chemicals that are very good for the vascular system, kind of like that grape seed extract that we talked about. All right, here it goes again. Exercise. If we can't get the blood moving in the vascular system, oh boy. So the key here is, is you want to get things moving, want to get things flowing for the cellulite, the veins, the varicose veins, got to keep moving for prevention and to reduce the pain that's associated with them once you already have it. Other options other than medical surgical options, and th those are available as well, you can speak to your physician about them, but there are support hose that will help support uh, the legs. I mean, you still want the circulation, but obviously the pain, if you don't, it can help reduce pain, the support hose. Elevate the legs above the head for a minimum of 20 minutes a day. So a reason to sit on the couch and watch TV, but with your feet elevated. Getting your feet above your head, not just sitting there on the coffee table, getting it above your head will help reduce. It gets the blood to flow out of there, gives the veins a little bit of rest. Don't cross your legs. A lot of us women, we dub, you know, cross it or even double cross our legs. When you cross your legs, it cuts off the circulation and the blood supply to the legs. So try to avoid that as much as you possibly can. This is tough for a lot of people, but avoiding standing for long periods of time without, uh, you know, you need to kind of shift your weight, do whatever you can, walk around, or sitting for long periods of time as well. You gotta get up, get things moving along. Do the best you can to not have to stand in one place or at least shift your weight around. Okay, I hope this uh, helps uh, address some of these issues for you. Um, we'll be moving on to our next segment, which is the fitness portion of our show. fitness portion of our show. Today we'll be using the handy dandy dish towel or any type of towel that's probably approximate about the same size um, to do a little bit of biceps and triceps and a little bit of chest and this is something you can do in your kitchen anywhere when you um, get out of your bathtub whatever it is you can do a little bit of good morning exercises to get the blood flowing. Um, first of all, I'm going to demonstrate uh, what would be a triceps and biceps. Um, what we're going to do is we use our own resistance on this, and we use the towel, and we resist with both arms. So I'm resisting while I'm curling up this one here on my right bicep, okay? And then on the other side, I'm hitting the tricep. So when we switch the towel over, we can do the same kind of thing. We're going to hit the bi, bicep, and see that bicep? It's just working there. And then what's interesting is you see the tricep lowering down as well, and we get a nice little work of this particular muscle called the tricep. We also have exercises that can help with chest and strengthening the separation between our breast tissue. A nice little one, just hold the towel out in front of you, and you're just going to pull it and just kind of hold it there. It's like an isometric exercise where you just hold it real tight for about 30 seconds and then you release it and let it rest. Something you can use for shoulders with the towel is you kind of resist back and forth. And mind you, you're using your body's own natural resistance so you're a lot less likely to get injured and you can kind of be easier on yourself or you can be harder on yourself with this type of exercise. And the handy dandy towel can be used in so many different exercises. Uh, as a trainer, I could run through a whole workout with, with, with a towel. I hope that those exercises will prove to be useful and we're gonna be moving on to our research analyst section of our show. To the research uh, analysis portion of our show, and with us today is Ralph Turciano, our show research analyst. Ralph? Thank you for the intro. Yeah, today's segment seems to be more of a personal responsibility segment, at least when it comes to government and regulation. But let's start off with our first study. The first study shows that calcium significantly improves children's bone health. Now, what's interesting about the study is that when children that were deprived of calcium for a long period of time started taking calcium, they were actually able to catch up on their bone density. The disturbing part about this, which was done by Penn State College of Medicine, was this. Out of 3,100 children, 
with 21 randomized studies, they discovered that out of boys, 7 out of 10 did not even get the recommended daily allowance of calcium. Out of girls, 9 out of 10 did not even get the recommended daily allowance of calcium. In this age of osteoporosis awareness and bone density, a 90% deficiency rate among children is something to truly be concerned about. So definitely, if you can, reanalyze your child's diet and make sure at least they're getting close to the RDA of 1,300 milligrams of calcium per day for, ch for children. After that, an interesting twist on an old problem, hay fever. They discovered that hay fever actually seems to have a benefit. Now, what caught the researchers off guard was this. They were checking to find out whether allergies cause non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. What they discovered was that they, well, basically I should say they thought that allergies did cause it. They discovered the exact opposite. They discovered for every atopic allergy that a person had, basically for one atopic allergy, I, sorry about that, the risk of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma went down by 25%. If they had three allergies, or allergies are three separate things, they discovered that the chance of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma went down 40%. Interesting twist and something that may be seen as a real inconvenience or a problem. So we have to really be careful what diseases or ailments we look at to cure because we may not know exactly why it's there, which is real interesting. This was done at the University of New South Wales. After that, a bigger issue, prescription drug addiction. Now, I'm going to read you some interesting statistics on prescription drug abuse. But first, let me start with the first comment that some parents were made uh, regarding their kids being addicted to prescription drugs. For example, this one was given by Stephen Perez of Drug Free America. He said, there's very low social disapproval. In fact, there are parents who are almost relieved that their kids are using Vicodin and not smoking marijuana, he said. Now, obviously, that's effective propaganda where you think one is more dangerous than the other. But now let me give you the statistics. Other deaths, which are less celebrated, I should say. In the age group of 45 to 54, overdose deaths fueled by prescription drugs now surpass motor vehicle deaths as the number one cause of accidental death by the federal data all shows. Since then, drug abuse since year 2000, prescription drug abuse has increased by 80%. The number of painkillers prescribed now just in the first part of 2008, prescription-wise, was 180 million prescriptions. Right now, the death rate, in, let's, for example, let's take a state out of, for, just out of uh, context here, let's take Florida. The rate of deaths caused by prescription drugs was, this is their words, not mine, three times the rate of death caused by all illicit drugs combined, according to analysis of 2007 autopsies by Florida Medical Examiner's Commission released in June. So that's something to make you think about. For example, if you think about drug abuse as far as illicit, outside of it right now, costs in the U.S. close to, they believe, $73 billion a year, just in insurance issues along with this alone. So again, prescription drugs do have a price. Just be careful research it, and try not to make it something which you're dependent on the rest of your life. Otherwise, you have a high chance of becoming one of these statistics. Outside of that, next statistic. Researchers now believe, from John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, believe by the, at this current rate of weight gain, by the year 2030, at least 86% of the United States will be obese or overweight. If you are black, chances are you'll be in 91% category. Mexican-American, I'm uh, sorry, if you're black, you're in the 96% category. Mexican-American, 91% of that category. That means, for example, the Mexican-American population, one of every 10 people will be adequate weight. 90% white, Mexican, black, plus, will be overweight or obese. This is a national emergency. And what has to happen is, I know tons of people that don't want to be heavy, they try to diet. They do everything they're told. But what the National Institute of Health has to start getting involved in is looking at environmental issues, whether it be chemical, whether it be poor diet advice, refinement of food, or whatever it is, they need to get down to it. No chemical contamination plays a huge role in weight gain and hormone disruption and thyroid disorders. They need to start researching it because by 2030, if these statistics come true, global warming is going to be the least of our concerns. After that, another one. 
Sharon Plow, Merck's, you may have heard of uh, these drug companies, Sharon Plow and Merck. They have a drug called Vitorin. Now this one has got some interesting aspects to it because a lot of people take it. But a lot of people also don't know, according to a European study, that it performed no better than a placebo at lowering the risk of major cardiovascular events, including heart attack, heart surgery, and death in patients with aortic stenosis. It did cut cholesterol though by 60%. However, everyone seemed to die a little faster on the medication. However, did the FDA issue any warnings on it yet? No still out there and about one and a half to two million prescriptions are still being filled by that medication. An interesting thing enough, we had some double speak on it too and I can understand the confusion. The people that did the research said, quote, you don't help that valve disease but you do help patients by protecting other heart blood vessels and reducing heart attacks and the need for bypass surgery or artery clearing or angioplasty, said Sir Richard Pedro of Oxford University, a statistician and cancer expert who analyzed the data. Now let's go back to the results again. No better than a placebo lowering risk of major cardiovascular events. Uh, begin to wonder after a while if these researchers are even beginning to read their own data. Now never mind, as far as the financial impact, uh, Sharon Plower Merck did a good job of not releasing that information until after the stock markets closed to realize it may have some negative effects. But there's also one more twist to the story which I like to see more people inquire about. They said, in one of the studies, that Vitorin increased cancer risk by 50%. That is just a phenomenal number. But in order to cover it up to some say, they looked at two other studies to basically reduce those findings down. It's two studies which were not complete yet, just to basically knock the edge off that 50% increase in cancer risk potential, which I find incredible. Now, a Dr. Harlan Crumbles of Yale University says he doubts that Vitorin causes cancer, but he did say one thing. If I'm a patient considering taking it, it still bothers me, he said, and until other Vitorin studies are finished in a few years, it will remain unclear whether and how the drug benefits patients beyond what Zocar and other statins do. And the most criminal part and aspect about that is this. Why is the drug on the market if other drugs are less expensive, less harmful, and do a better job? you got to ask yourself that question. Why are people being prescribed a drug that has yield no benefit than less harmful medications? That's a criminal thing that people have to really consider. But also, too, if you're on it, ask your doctor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ralph. Excellent information. Um, pay attention to this, you guys, particularly having to do with obesity um, and all this other data and information. Do further research on your own. Very, very, very vital. Thanks again for joining the um, I gotta get the show right again, <laughs> the Fit and Healthy Show. Have a great day.